My name is Martin G. And I've spent the past 15 years or so in corporate America doing a number of things from building websites to building infrastructure. And over the course of the time of my time in corporate America, I've noticed that there is a, a large group of people who want to get into tech, but they don't really know what they can do or they think that there's this large barrier. There's this big knowledge gap. And yes, there are some knowledge gaps that exist. But my goal today is to help you to see how technology is not all that complicated, or at least it doesn't have to be forever. So I want to help you to see how you can go from being just a, a consumer of products, especially in the tech space, to being a creator or being a producer of these same products. We see right now that there is a flurry of AI tools that are taking over the market. We've probably heard of AI tools like ChatGPT, which is probably one of the most popular ones. And we've seen how people are starting to use it as well as some other AI tools as well. And we are seeing and we're hearing that we're going to be out of jobs. We're going to be automated out of jobs. We're going to be automated into in the sense where computers are going to do everything for us and we're not going to have anything to do. Well, there are pros and there are cons to a scenario like that. But what I want to challenge you today to think about is where are you going to be on that side of the equation when and if that does come to be the case? Are you going to be one of the ones who are who are consuming the products that are being created? Or are you going to be one of the ones who's producing the products? Are you going to become one of the thinkers in the future who's going to begin to leverage AI to build something that is an asset for you to use and possibly for your family to use and maybe even for the masses to use? Are you going to be one of those producers of this content or of an application or are you going to be a consumer of it? The choice is yours. And as we discuss in the Tech Talk today, we'll go over how you can do just that, how you can become a producer of these products instead of just being a consumer of it. It's not as hard as you might think. So join me as I go through a project and I'll go through a short presentation describing why it's important to tap into AI and why AI is going to become one of the techs of the future. Don't be afraid of tech. Embrace it. And hopefully this is helpful for you. If you need any assistance or if you have any questions, feel free to comment below. Feel free to uh, reach out at CorridorOfFameAcademy.com. I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback. I would love, love, love to hear from you. So let me know how helpful this has been and good luck. Welcome to today's Tech Talk. Now, we probably heard by now uh, so many different topics about AI. We've seen things about ChatGPT. We've seen how AI is going to replace everyone. We've seen how we need to start to use AI or or else we'll be replaced by AI in the future. Or in reality, sometimes that future seems to be right here, right now. And many of the tools that we've seen so far, uh, we've been using them from a consumer standpoint. And so today I wanna to talk about how we can actually go from being just consumers of these AI products to learning how to produce some of them as well. And I know you may say that technology is a big black box for you or it's something that you're not that interested in learning, but you're probably seeing all around you every day how it's becoming more and more important. And the reality is that many of us will have our job, have our lives uprooted and our jobs changed sometimes overnight because AI is being programmed to do many of the things that we were doing before. So join me on this tech talk on this tech talk today and let's see what we have to talk about. So I'm actually going to start with discussing how we can go from being a consumer to a creator, and that's using the power of AI. Now let's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be brief with this presentation because we're gonna have a presentation and then I'm gonna talk about why AI, we're gonna talk about the existing tools that are there, and we're gonna talk about how we can leverage those existing tools. And then we're gonna talk about the project because at the end of this, we're actually gonna do a an actual project where you will create an AI project from scratch. So let's just get right to it. 
Uh, the first question is why AI? Well, there are a lot of reasons why someone may want to choose AI as a field or as something that they just want to tap into to play around with. Um, and financial reasons is probably one of the biggest reasons because globally it's showing that globally uh, we see that artificial intelligence has a market size or market share of about 428 billion as of 2022. And it's projected to grow from $515 billion in 2023 to $2 trillion by 2030. So what that means is that there is massive opportunities for many of us. Now, the question is, where are you going to be on this on this equation? Are you going to be one of the ones who's benefiting from this financial influx of capital? Or are you going to be the ones who's paying the finance, who are, who's using your finances to fund these other businesses that have already created these AI products? Uh, job security. As I've all already mentioned, we know that AI is going to be automating and it's already begun to automate a lot of jobs that people have been doing for years. And it's becoming more and more sophisticated. So the more sophisticated jobs are even going to be are even going to be uprooted at some point. So you're going to have to start to learn how to use it to in order to see what how you can leverage it in your business. And then there is an unlimited potential. If you can think back to times before before social media existed, think about times before uh, something like Facebook existed or, or MySpace, if you remember it, or even before Twitter existed, before TikTok existed. There was a world that was around before these existed. And because technology grew and grew at, an, at a fast pace, companies were able to be birthed out of the new realm of technology. So we stand right now on a horizon of a new world that is going to be created. Now, AI is not a new field at all, but it is becoming more and more used and it's becoming more evident to people, to everyday people, how it's being used. So we're going to see a little bit more of the other or of other ways that you can use AI, but for, or why you will want to use AI, but I see an unlimited potential right now. There are some things that I can't even conceive of. And hopefully you can after we've gone over some things in this in this uh, slide. Uh, so, yes, there are some AI tools that exist currently and uh, they are in healthcare, they're in finance and they're also in manufacturing. You probably have seen some AI tools uh, or AI applications already. So if you do know some, go ahead and, and uh, comment below where you've seen them or maybe some of the apps that you've heard of. Um, I'm only going to cover a couple of them, and uh, one of those is Remini. Um, you've probably seen how a lot of people are using Remini right, Remini right now for um, generating images. So you can essentially give it an image. If it's an old image, it can restore a blur. It can restore an old image or a blurry image. It can make enhancements on images for you, and it can kind of give you a different aesthetic. And um, so that's one that's that's really really popular at the moment. Uh, and then we have ChatGPT, which most people have probably heard of, and a lot of people probably have only heard of ChatGPT because it's probably one of the most popular ones. But it's definitely not the only one. And so what ChatGPT is, if you haven't heard, is something that you can use to build chatbots. You can use it to build virtual assistants, or you can use it as a chatbot or as a virtual assistant, or even uh, for language translation. And what this essentially, how this essentially works is you have a, a model, which is really a subset of data that ChatGPT is using to, in order to give people information. So you will go to ChatGPT, you would give it a prompt, and then ChatGPT will give you some information back. That's how a lot of people have been using ChatGPT up until this point. They use it from the front end stand of view or the front end point of view. But what if I told you there was another way that you can access ChatGPT? And with this other way, you can actually use it to build your own tools. Well, that's how we can go from being a consumer of these products to being a producer of products or to be creators of products. Because now we are tapping into something that is not necessarily uh, easy to access. So it, it is easy to access, but it's easy to access only if you're aware that it exists. So how can we actually do this then? What is it? 
Uh, and that's a, it says exiting tools. That's definitely existing tools. So we are leveraging existing tools and we're doing that with what's called an API. So an application interface, it's called an application programming interface. And it it is, think of it like a waiter at a restaurant. So I'm just gonna read this. Just how you, just like how you give your order to the waiter and the kitchen prepares your food, an API helps different apps and programs communicate with each other and share information. And for me, I actually like to think of it like a library. So you have information that a lot of people have collected over the years and they've stored it in books and these books are inside of the library. So if you want to, you don't have to go and do and conduct like brand new research on topics that have already been, that are already existing. Someone has already conducted the research. So you would just go and reference their work and build upon their work to create something new. You wouldn't go and reinvent the wheel unless you were trying to dispel something that someone else created. But that's another story. So I think of it like a, like a library. Someone has already built something and they've made it easy for you to access and use this information to build on it and to build something even bigger. Uh, some examples of APIs in everyday life, we we use them every day. If you're not aware of it, you're, you're, you're using it even right now, watching this, wherever you're watching it from, an API was involved in this process to get this video from me to you. And um, so for instance, we have weather apps that use APIs to get data, um, to get real-time data information. Um, we have social media platforms that use, that they actually build APIs and they allow third parties to use their APIs to get access to information like posts, um, like videos, or it just other information that they may make publicly available. And then you have other things like calendar apps. If you've ever used Calendly, you've probably um, had maybe your Google Calen Calendar sync to it or Outlook Calendar sync. And even with those, those are using APIs on the back end to make them all work. All right, now, how do you actually use an API? I know I'm talking about it, but what do you actually have to do to use it? And just think of it from a high level point of view. The first thing that you wanna do or that you want is you want to have some type of documentation. Every API that is available will have, or every good API will have some type of documentation that tells you how to actually use it. And then once you figured out the documentation, you found the documentation for, it, let's say if you were trying to use uh, the Facebook API, Facebook will have, or Meta would have documentation around that API. So once you found the documentation, then you would need to determine what project you are actually trying to build. So in order to build the project, you need to know what APIs in the documentation you need to reference. And then once you've determined the project that you're building, then you'll need to be, then you'll need to generate an API key. And in uh, most cases, this is something that you can uh, generate fairly easily, but you would, the, the way this works is you have an API key that is used to authenticate your application that you're building to the actual backend to say, this is a, a, a real um, genuine application. All right, and then once you have that connection there, uh, then you would want to make API requests. So now that you now that you have an API key connected from your connecting your application to the back end or to that API, then you will want to start to make API requests. Once you've connected, then you can start to call the API to get the information that you want. And so when you make that call, you're going to structure your call in a certain way for the API to understand it. The API is going to receive that request and then it's going to send something back in a way that your application should be able to understand it. And I know if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now, just stay with me. I promise an application, it'll be a lot clearer. So um, that's how to use an API. Now, I'm talking about APIs. Yes, they're cool. But why do you want to build your own AI project? Well, I've kind of already mentioned it. One, you want to be able to um, be able to navigate in this world in the future because the, the jobs that we've had in the past are not necessarily going to be the jobs that we have in the future. 
So learning a new skill, learning a new skill set is something that can help build your resume and just build your your um, sense of awareness of other things that are available for you. It'll open up opportunities for you um, maybe to think a little bit differently about how you approach business or creativity in general. And uh, so I think those are some really good ways as to or reasons as to why you want to build an AI project. It's just something to keep kind of keep your keep you um, abreast with technology. All right. Now, in order to build the project that we're going to be doing today, um, it helps to know a couple of things. And I'm not going to go too deeply into these, but I just want to um, just want to kind of touch on these because these are going to be in use in the project. But I'm not going to go too deeply into those. Not at this moment. But if you do need information about these, definitely feel free to reach out at info at corridor of fame and uh, just or even comment on this video and we'll be glad to um, to go deeper into certain topics that may or may not make sense to you so the first thing that I want to talk about is source control now when you're doing your pro when you're working on a project um, a lot of times you let's say you start on a desktop and you're modifying your files on your computer but and you save it on your computer now, what happens if you go to another computer? You have to make sure that those files are saved somewhere where you can access it on the other computer. And then what if you wanted to actually collaborate with someone else where you wanted to share files across across many computers, uh, across many different people on a team? Then this is where you have something like source control um, because you can use source control to save your work. You can also use 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 source control to save your work incrementally. So maybe you uh, make changes every every couple of hours. You save changes every couple of hours. Well, you can if you save those changes and commit those changes to source control, you can go back and see what those files look like historically. And not just you, but everyone else who has access to those files can see the history of all the changes that were created from the inception of the file. So that's a little bit about source control. And, um, and they're one of the main ones that we're, what, what we're going to be using is Git and GitHub. So uh, if you're not familiar with those, I would um, I'm going to drop some links and just get more familiar with Git GitHub. Uh, and then we're going to be using React JS again. I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but just know that React is a way to build web applications. And uh, that, that's really all I'm going to say about that. Uh, it's using Node.js and uh, in JavaScript. So if you have some experience building JavaScript, then learning React.js won't be that big of an issue. Uh, and then command line. Uh, you don't always have to use the command line. I just tend to use the command line a lot. Uh, you, you have a lot more flexibility with things that you can do, but I will do my best to show you the command line examples as well as some of the graphical examples because I know there are different, le different levels of, uh, of understanding here. So I wanna be able to show people other multiple ways that you can do it. And um, Visual Studio Code. Um, so you wanna have an IDE um, which is an integrated development environment. And this is essentially something that you can use to build code. And uh, so the main, the one we're gonna be using is Visual Studio Code. And again, I'll have the link for this um, so that you can download if you don't already have it. All right, now let's talk about the project. Now, these are some of the things, some of the things that you will need. I've already mentioned Git. Um, you will need a GitHub account. Uh, you will need uh, GitHub Desktop. Or you don't have to use GitHub Desktop. That is actually optional. But if you want it to be, if you want to see this done in a, a graphical user interface way away from the command line, then use GitHub Desktop. Um, Homebrew is something that uh, I actually use. Um, it can be used to install most of these other items that are below it. Uh, and so except for the OpenAI account, you will need an OpenAI account. You will need to install Node.js, um, and you can do that with Homebrew. You will need to install Yarn, um, which you can also do with Homebrew, and um, you will need to install Visual Studio Code. And also iTerm2. I use iTerm2, but you can also use your terminal. And again, these instructions are mostly for Mac, so uh, I don't have the Windows instructions just yet. 
that will come soon. All right. Now let's talk about the project here. So today we want to think about how we can build a project that will allow us to generate images. Uh, we've seen projects already that generate images, but how can we create our own? And I want you to see that it's not too terribly complicated to do that. So that's what we're going to be working on today. And uh, just really quick before I get started with that, uh, if you need to access, if you need to create a GitHub account, you can do that by going to github.com and going to sign up. And that will get you create, get you an account created. Once you do that, you also, if you want GitHub desktop, you can go to desktop.github.com and download. It should show you the version for your uh, machine, whatever you have. And then homebrew, uh, if you go to docs.brew.sh, this should give you the instructions for installing homebrew on your machine. All right. Now I'm going to close that. So this is the essentially the project that we're going to be creating. And what we have is uh, is really simple, but what we want to do is insert a prompt for an image. So I'm going to do three, as you can see, I was doing this already. So if I type three chocolate Labrador retrievers, what this should do is it should generate an image for me and once it generates the image, I should be able to download the image. So uh, once the image creates, as you can see, here's the image that it has. Yes, they look, some of them look a little off. I didn't say the images were gonna be perfect. I just said you were gonna get images. So if I click download, it should save this image to my machine and it did. So here is the image. Like I said, it looks a little, they look a little weird, but it's an image. Okay. So that's all we're doing. We're just creating a simple project where we can do that. Now you're probably wondering, well, where do we start next? So remember anytime we're building something, I actually like to say, that we should begin with the end in mind. So essentially this is the end. How you're viewing this right now is the end. And yes, there, this can be made to look a little better, but this is essentially just for functionality. We wanna see how we can tap into an API to use and to create this application. So in order to use an API, we have to know what type of, what this API actually is. And we, what I can say is, I know this is going to be using ChatGPT, but I want to use ChatGPT from the producer side instead of just the consumer side. I want to actually leverage the ChatGPT API. And so in order to do that, I actually need to go to platform.openai.com. And this is the company that actually owns uh, ChatGPT. So when you go there, I if I wanted to look at the documentation, I will go to documentation. And if I'm scrolling through here, I will see a lot of information about how to use this API. Um, for this project specifically, I will go to guides. And if I go to image generation, then I can see that they have some options here. They, they actually show you how to use this, or how to build this. So as I can see, one example that it gives me, this it says to generate an image. This is the code to generate an image. If you look here, it will give you different libraries, um, different libraries, are, and these are different coding languages that this is built in. So different coding examples. So if we were to be building a Python project, we would click here and select Python and it would give us the code to get get this image in Python. Same thing with curl. If we were doing this straight from the command line, we would do that. But we're doing Node.js. And so this is something that we will want to know. Now, if I keep scrolling through here again, it will show me how to use it. And so this is really the most one of the most important parts. It shows me how to use it. It show it gives me uh, an example of what should happen. So if I give it a prompt, 
a white Siamese cat, I should get an image of a Siamese, a white Siamese cat. So the more information I give the prompt, the more, uh, the more detailed my prompt is, the more information will be in the resulting image. So let's actually go from there. That is, so that's essentially what we're going to be building and we're going to be using the open API API in order to build it. Now, I just want to go to uh, GitHub just really quickly. So I'm by the time you see this, this uh, you should be able to access this code on this GitHub page. Now, what you will do once you get here is you will navigate to this page and you would, there are two ways that you can do this or a couple ways, there's probably three ways you can do this. Um, on the command line, you would just go to code local and uh, either HTTPS, SSH, or GitHub CLI. In a lot of cases, it will be HTTPS. And you would go to copy. And on your command line, you would go to the file or you would go to the folder where this file should be. And you would do git space clone space and then paste that. And it would download all of the files into that directory. Um, I've already done that, so I don't have to do that part. Um, another way that you could do this is to use the open with GitHub desktop. And so when you select that, it will give you the option to open in the GitHub desktop. And then it will give you a pop-up that's like this. Uh, well, it'll actually ask you what location you want to save the file, save the files. And so you would just select those, select that location and it would save the files for you. Once you do that, you would click on the project or right click on the project. And if you have Visual Studio Code included, if you're using Visual Studio Code, um, then you would click open in Visual Studio Code. And it should open the file for you. OK, so if you don't have that, if you don't have um, GitHub already, then it would be easier to go ahead and create that. But if you don't, then we're actually going to build this project without GitHub, without source control. But just know if you want to come back and modify your files later or if you want to share your files, it'll be a lot harder if you don't do if you don't use source control. So we are in a blank file. And then also what I want to show you before I get started is inside of Visual Studio Code, you can go to terminal and then new terminal. This is if you don't have iTerm and all of the commands that I'm running in iTerm too, you can run here as well. Uh, I'm just choosing not to because sometimes this doesn't really perform that well when I try to use those commands. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my file structure inside of my iTerm project and I'll just do an ls command which is just listing the files that are in here. I only see a readme file. Now ls doesn't show all of the hidden files and the hidden files are to can typically be the ones that have a dot in front of them. So if I do an ls dash lah then I can see the other files and folders that are in here. So now I see a dot env, I see a dot env example a dot get, a dot get ignore, and a readme. So I'm not going to go too deeply into all of them, but I just wanted to show you that real quick. Uh, and so let's go ahead and get started. I want to first create a um, a node project. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a yarn init. And it's going to ask a few questions. Um, it's going to ask you what image or what's the name for this project image generator is fine so i'll do that for the version you can leave it as the default um again just by pressing enter or return um i'm just going to give it a version 0 .0. Uh, 0 0.0.0.2.0 and then description i'm going to say cof image generator Entry point, we can leave this as the default, which is index.js. Press enter. Repository URL, that is correct for me. 
I'm going to leave the author as this um, private. I'll say true for now. Okay, so now it has created a package.json file. And let me just go into Visual Studio Code and see this file. All this file has right now is just what I've installed from the command line. Okay, so what I need for this project is I'm going to need some dependencies. So I'm going to be building this project using Next.js. And I'm also going to be using uh, React. Now, even, even before that, and so I'm going to be using Next.js, I'm going to be using React, and I'm also going to be using OpenAI for my project. So all of those have different packages that I want available to me. So I want to be able to use each of them in my project. So in order to do that, I'm going to copy, I'm actually going to copy an existing file that I have, and I'm just going to paste this content over here. So I'm just going to paste that this way. Now, this is a script section that I copied, the dependencies section. And in my dependencies, you see I have Next, I have OpenAI, and I have React and React DOM. Now, if these don't make sense to you, then it's okay. Don't, um, don't worry. We'll actually cover these a little bit later. But essentially, these are all I'm going to be including. So if I save that, now I'm good. Now this package.json file is going to actually control what's installed. So because I now have that in there and I have the dependencies labeled, now I'm going to do a yarn dev or actually yarn install first. And what this is going to do is it's going to install all of the packages that are listed inside of these dependencies. And when I run install, it's actually doing it. That's what the install is going to do. It's going to do an install of all of the packages that I need in order to make my project work. And it will take some time. I know people will probably say that there's, uh, I know with the newer version of Yarn, um, there is something called plug and play, but I haven't updated and I'm actually kind of, uh, I haven't, I haven't played with it yet. So I'm not gonna plug and play today at all with this project. Okay, so now this is finished and what you I'm going to go back into Visual Studio Code and I'm going to just look through my files here. So make sure, first of all, make sure that you're on the Explorer tab and make sure, yeah, make sure you're on the Explorer tab. Now, when I did the install, it created a node modules folder that now has those dependencies that I mentioned. So if I scroll through here, I can see next. I see the next dependency that I added here. If I scroll more, I should see open AI. And I do. I should also see react and react DOM. So that is going to install all of the all the dependencies that I need. Now we can go from there and move on to the next part. So I know for this, I will need a um, a pages folder. So I'm going to right click in here. And I'm going to go to new folder and I'm going to type pages. I also know that I'm going to need an API folder. So I'm going to right click, go to new folder and type API. Okay. Now inside of my pages folder or directory, I need to create an index.js file. So I'm going to right click on pages, go to new file and then type index.js. Okay. So now I have a blank file and we're ready to get started. So one of the first things I want to do in this file is I'm actually going to do an import 
and this import is just coming from um, and, and I'm not going to go into all every single line that I do actually um, but some of these imports will just make our lives a lot simpler as we begin to build the project so for this I'm just going to type export default function and we'll call this home and this just just follow me all right so this is home and then I will inside of this home I need a return okay so this is the syntax for these and with react I'm not going to go into how the how all of these components work but you're probably looking at this and you're seeing HTML but that's essentially what this is it is HTML so we're going to be uh, react allows us to um, display HTML in a dynamic way so we're essentially creating pages or creating content on the page dynamically instead of just static content so for this I want to do a couple of things here inside of the div this is where my content will go so I'm going to create a head based on this import that I did at the top and I'm going to give it a title and I'm going to call this COF for corridor of fame image I'm going to say Academy image generator okay and then I'm going to under that so this is the head under that I'm going to create a main okay uh, let's see I'll create an h3 here just for a header 3 and I'm going to call this image generator so let me save this and see what if anything this has generated now I'm going to save this in order to run this I'll go into uh, I'll go into the command line or in my case I term to I'm going to go there and I'm going to go into the project folder underneath the uh, root level directory root level directory means like the the main folder structure so uh, inside the main folder and I'm going to type yarn dev now what this is going to do is it's going to start this on it's going to start this running on my machine and this it normally builds it on port 3000 but because I have something else running right now it's not using port 3000 and I'm going to actually going to stop what I have running so that I can use port 3000 and I'm going to kill that by using control C and then yarn dev again and as you can see it did start on port 3000 you shouldn't have that problem but if I want to see this in my browser then I would copy this and go to that in my browser now as you can see I have image generator here and we also have COF Academy image generator here all right now let's go on let's move on so okay all right now one of the first things that we wanted to, that we want to do is to create the uh, actually I should have left that other one up But one of the things that we want to do is we want to be able to create something that allows people to insert a prompt, right? So I'm going to pull up this other project. And as we can see, we have a prompt. So this is really an input or this is really a form. So the first thing that we want to do is create some type of form. So let me go back and I'm going to come into my uh, page and under this h3 
I'm just gonna call a form, create a form. Okay, now a form is, uh, let's see, inside of here. So now I have a form and then in the form, I wanna create an input variable or an input value. Uh, and there are a couple ways to write this. I'm gonna do this. Okay, do that. Okay, so for input, I'm gonna do type. The type is gonna be a type of text. I'm gonna, it needs a name and I'm gonna call that placeholder or actually I did that wrong. So it's, it's a name and I'm gonna call that image prompt. Okay, it needs a placeholder. And for that, I'm gonna say, please insert a prompt for an image. And I'm getting this, so this placeholder text is essentially what this value is. And so that's why I'm inserting that there. Uh, also, the reason I'm giving this a name is so that I can use this later on. And uh, for value, I'm going to create this. And for now, I'm going to put image prompt in here. And I will show you why I'm using this in a second. Okay. So, uh, let me actually save this and see if this will load. Okay. It's not going to load. All right. Now, don't worry about that error right now because we're about to fix it. So once we have this, and there is another line we're going to need to add here, but I'm just going to fix this error first. So we want to actually create some variables. So let's create a variable here. This variable is what this form is going to need in order to store these values. So I'm going to create a prompt image prompt, and then I want to create a set image prompt. Now you're probably saying, okay, well, what does this even mean now? The reason that we're using this and the reason that we're using this is because we need to be able to understand the state of our application or the state of the information on the page. So in order to do that, we need to import another library that's called use state that is a part of react. So whenever I do that, you will see that this import statement um, became available. So essentially what that does is allows us to actually update this value um, while we're on this page. So you can just copy and paste it just that, just like that. So we need image prompt and then we'll also need another one and that's going to be for image result. And then we'll have a set image result. And it's gonna be the same thing. So this, it tells you what this value is going to be. And this allows you to actually set the value to whatever it's going to be. Um, and this is, this is how you reference the value later on. So now th if I save this, it should get rid of this error where it says this image prompt is not defined. So I'm going to save it and it does. So now you can see I have a form or a piece of a form with just the input, it says, in, please import, insert a prompt for an image. Okay, so now I have one more thing that I need to add to this input, and that's going to be on change. So whenever this input is changed, whenever someone types something, I need to save it. And so that's what we're about to do here. So to do that, you need something called on change. And I know the syntax for this might look a little weird, but, um, or, you know, the way this is written may look a little weird, but just stay with me. So I'm gonna type it and then explain it. Okay, so this is saying that whenever this value, whenever this input is changed, 
get the value of it, get the value that is changed to and save it inside of the value inside of this target's value. So get the value of it, get the value that is changed to and save it. And so essentially when I use this set image prompt, this is going to set image prompt to that value of image prompt. Okay. So now this you won't see happening, but it is something that's actually happening. Now, the other thing that I want to do is if I go back to here to this, I can see that there's a, a button here for create image. So I want to be able to create, I want to actually be able to use a button. So that's another type of input that I need to add. And I'll just do it right under here. And for this, I uh, actually did the same thing again. So for that, we'll do an input of type submit. And let's see, the value should be create image. Okay, so now if I save that, you'll see a button popped up for create image. Now, it doesn't do anything just yet, but it's there. Okay, so nothing happens when I click it. Now, let's think about what we actually want to happen. So we want we want to be able to generate an image whenever, or to create an image whenever we click this button. So let me actually write some of this down in here. I'm gonna write these as comments just to get the logic out. So we want to create uh, or we want to get the prompt from a user. I should have actually done this before, but that's okay. So we want to get a prompt from a user. And then once we get a prompt from a user, we want to send the prompt to uh, OpenAI or ChatGPT. And then we want to update the view to show an image and then we want to download the image so i think it's safe to say that those are the steps that we want to complete all right now in order to get the prompt there are a couple of i mean we're we're halfway there because the person is already at this point you can type a prompt here okay uh, but just nothing happens whenever we send. So, and even if you notice what I did just now, right? So I'm going to type this, just type some word or letters and I press create image. As you can see, it saved this as image prompt and it's got the value of this, what I just typed in. Notice this value of image prompt. It matches the name that we gave it here. So this is how we're going to use this later on. Okay, now let's go a little bit further. So I actually want to do, I so the first thing, get the prompt for, from the user. In order to do that, I have to do that whenever this button is pressed. So basically whenever this is submitted, that's whenever I would get this information. So that's the first thing that we need to think about. Um, and Whenever you are dealing with forms inside of HTML, then you can also have something that will determine what happens whenever that form is submitted. So in order to determine what happens whenever the form is submitted, you need to add a function here. So this is going to be called on submit. And what this basically means is that whatever is going to happen, what is going to happen whenever this is submitted what function do you want to take place so i'm just going to call this on submit um, but this could be named anything so i'm going to call this function on on submit and i'm saying whenever this form is submitted i want you to do something and now i'm about to tell it what i want it to do so in order to do that let's create an async function 
okay and we're we're gonna we're gonna call this on submit okay and this is the syntax for it okay so now I'm going to write something and I'm, I'm saying I want whenever this is submitted I want for you to try to do something but if this doesn't work then I want you to catch whatever happened like make a note of whatever happened as to why it didn't work and I want you to give me an error if it didn't work but I want you to try this first so using that logic I'm gonna write what's called a try catch block and so what this is saying is just what I just explained I want you to try to once you get the prompt from the user I want for you to try to send this to open API okay so actually I should have this could be here honestly so I'll just move this to say send the prompt to user because this is essentially where this is going to be happening so I want for you to do this and in order to send something to this user or in order to send the prompt to open API I have to use the open API's API so before I do that I want to create another file so I'm actually going to say let me let me put this here so I want you to try to send the prompt to open API um, print an error if it doesn't work okay so in order to send the prompt to open API let's go ahead into our API folder and let's right click it and let's, let's click new file so we're gonna call this generate this is where most of the work is going to be or a good bit of the work is going to be happening so I'll create a generate.js file and in that generate.js uh, file we're going to import some libraries from the open API library so let's just do these and if you follow the documentation it will tell you what you need to Im import um, so these are the ones I'm going to be importing open API or open AI API and then configuration and my computers moving slowly okay so for the configuration let's I'm gonna just copy and paste this real quick and explain it in a moment okay so what this is saying is create a new configuration and this is saying the new type of now remember when we're using API's because now we're, we're starting to use their API or we're starting to use this we're starting to use open API's functionality so configuration it helps us to get connected to an API key and I know we haven't gotten our API key just yet but this is how that will be connecting uh, so we're going to open up create a new configuration that's going to be an open API configuration and the value that we're going to use is the open API key which we'll get in a moment and once we have that then let's create a new open API connection so I'm going to also paste this line that also says so after this is done if it cannot find an API key with the configuration once it looks up this file or gets this information if it doesn't have a valid API key then it's going to return an error okay so just close that now I'm going to save this real quick and now remember I want to um, actually go to open API so we talked a little bit about using open API and we talked about what you would need to do so you will want to 
you'll want to be able to understand their documentation and then you want to get an API key, right? So in order to get an API key, you need to create an account on openapi.com and you need to create, you need to actually link a card to this account. Now it doesn't cost very much to generate these images, um, but, but it is a pay as you go. I believe the images might be like two cents per image or something like that. So just be aware that you do need to link a card for this. Um, and I know they were even given some free, um, given some free tokens to be able to use in your account, uh, maybe like $18 worth. So that's more than enough to do this project. All right. Now, if you do, once you do get connected, you will click on your name over here and then you will go into view API keys. Now you're going to want to create a new secret key when you get that value. So you'll create a key when you, uh, let's see, I'm going to give this a, all right, I'll give it a name. And when you click create secret key, you're going to copy this value here. You're going to copy that value and go back to your project. If you don't already create a dot env file, or you can copy what's in the dot env dot example file, you can just rename this file to dot env. And you should see open API underscore API key, you will just paste your key in here. Now, please be aware, this key is extremely secret, you want to keep this safe, you don't want this to be publicly exposed. Because if someone is able to publicly it, to access this, then they have access to your application and they can actually run up the bill in your account. So you want to make sure that you are holding on to this and treating it as you would your own wallet, your debit card, because it's very, very valuable. Now, obviously, I'm not going to use this key because you've seen this key. Uh, so I'm going to use a different key and I'm going to delete that one. But you again, you want to make sure that you're keeping your key safe, but you will need to leverage it for your project. So I'm, I'm going to keep that there for now, but I'm not. Well, that's not going to work because I just deleted it. So I'm going to put a new file in or a new key in here and get rid of this one. So just one second. Okay. Now, once you have this API key, then it should allow you to configure a project. So we don't need the API key anymore right now. And if we go back into our generate file, or we're still in our generate, we want to start to think about other things that are happening. So we're going to, once we know that we have an API key, okay, let's think logically about what we'll need to do here. So we want to we want to get the image prompt from the user from our uh, from our browser. We want to get the image prompt and then we want to create an image using the open API API. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to actually get that image prompt. And let me put that here, get the image prompt. And then I want to also say we want to uh, create image with open API and then send the image back. So this generate file is really just a communication with open API. That's all this is doing. It's just communicating with open API and then giving that information back to our browser. So just think of it that way. All right. So if I go ahead and let's see if I want to, how do I get the image prompt? Well, I get the image prompt from the request that sent whenever that submit button is pressed. 
whenever the um, input is sum is submitted, then it's going to store this in something called request.body.imageprompt. Now remember, image prompt is what we saw in the browser, right? So it's storing it there. Now, this really here is, it looks complicated, but it's not. It's really just making sure that this a valid value. So making sure that it's not blank. So if it's, if it's, bl if it's not blank, then we're good okay so the next thing that we want to do is we're actually going to create another try catch and we want to create the image with oh with open api so i'm gonna say try and i'm gonna do try and i wanted to try to create an image with open api now the reason i'm putting this into a try is because things fail we don't want to just assume that everything is going to work 100% of the time. And if it does fail, we want to be able to get an error message or to be able to understand why it failed. So make sure that even whenever you're building applications that you pay attention to error handling, which is um, essentially what this is, um, you can go a lot deeper into this. So I'm just putting some really basic examples about error handling, but just know in a real world application, you'll want to go more in depth. So we want to try to create an image with open API. Now, how do we do that? Well, let's go back to the documentation. So if we go back to image generation, remember this code that we, this code that we saw here actually does that it creates an image. And this is the prompt that it, that it creates an image with. So we can copy this and use that. So let's copy that. Okay. So, We'll copy and we'll paste that. So now it's going to try to create an image using this prompt in one size 1024 by 1024. And we can read the documentation to get what um, what parameters we would need to pass. So anytime we're using an API, it's going to tell you what information that you need to provide it in order for it to send the right information back. So in this case, it needs a prompt. It needs in, which is going to be the number of images that we want to generate. As you can see, when I hover over it, it shows me that. And then the size. So for each API that you may ever use, sometimes you will see it all on one page, everything that's available. I don't see it here, but even when you don't, if you have a, um, an IDE and it gives you uh, documentation so you can hover over it and see what information you need so if I hover over create image which is the function that OpenAI made available I would be able to see all of the different things that I can do or the information that it needs in order to give me the information that I'm asking for so create image here um, as you can see prompt image mask if i were if i were to be using all of these but i'm not um i can adjust the size so it tells you what the size has to be and and all that so you don't have to worry about that but i just wanted to show you that, that is possible and that's how you can see what other things you can do with the project so i'm just going to leave this just as it is i'm going to leave the i'm going to leave this as it is and then once it finishes then the other thing I want to do is I want to send the image back. So in order to send the image back, I'm going to just move this up to say I want to send the image back. So in order to send the image back, I need to create this. So I need to send a status of 200 and I'm going to create an object with the image result and then the value of this. So this image URL or this image URL is something that I need to define. Uh, so I would define image URL and the response that I get back from create image should have the URL of this image in there. So that's what this is doing. 
But even if it doesn't, let me just do a console.log just so I can see the value of image URL. So I want to save that first. And again, if this fails, I want to do something when an error occurs. Because no, I don't want errors, but reality is errors do happen. And so uh, as I copied and pasted this, you can see if there is an error, um, if there's an if there's a response in that error, then display it. Um, if not, then just show me the generic error. Give me a status of 500. Uh, and if you if this doesn't make sense, just comment below, and then we can go deeper into what this what this means, status, and on all of this. So I'll save that. Now. I believe this is most of the code that we need in this file. So we are getting the image prompt. We're getting the image prompt from this value. And then we're trying to create an image with open API. So we are sending a, re a request to open API. This is how we're using open APIs API. And then we're going to get that information back. We're storing it in a value called image URL. I want to log that value just so I can see what it is. And then I want this, I want to send this, and this is going to be sending this back to that form, but I'm sending it back to the front end with, uh, as it's going to be called image result. And this is the value that it's going to have. So I'm going to save that and let's come back to our index file. So now that we've created all the work in the generate file, this is what's going to happen anytime we anytime we try to push that button. This is what we want to happen. So now we've created the work that we want to happen. But now we need to actually send the prompt to ChatGPT. So two different files and two different functionalities. We're going to trigger it from the index file. And then the generate file is what's going to do the call to the API. So let's go from there and let's see how we can do that so the first thing is we want to make sure that we are sending a prompt to open api so we're going to, whenever that button is pressed, we're going to try to send a post call to API generate. So we're sending this to that other file. We're sending this content, we're sending this header, and we're sending this body, which is going to be the image prompt. We're sending this information to this other function that we've created. We're sending it here. This is how we're going to send it here. So. Once we do that, we are trying this and we hope that it works so we can do a couple of things here. So once we try it, I'm going to copy some more code for you. Um, and this is just because I've already written this um, and you didn't want to see me stumbling through figuring this out. So. We're going to get that risk whenever we make that call, then we're going to wait for a response. We're going to wait for this to finish. And so if it doesn't finish with the 200 and generally a 200 means that it's successful. If it does not finish with a 200, then we want to throw an error. That's what this is saying. Uh, if it does finish with a 200, then we want to uh, set the image result or set the result. Okay. So then if it does function properly, then we want to set the result. This is image result. Actually, we're going to, oh, yeah. So we'll set image result 
to data dot image result. And data has, so the response that we get from here is gonna come in as data, and then it's going to be, remember, it's gonna have this image result here because this is how we've defined it. Okay, so let's save that. And then I'm gonna just put a little bit of error checking, so print an error if it doesn't. So I'm gonna print an error and alert. So I'll save that. Now, I think this should give us something to see. So I'm just gonna refresh this page. And a couple of things that I wanna do, um, I want to open my console. So I'm gonna do Command Option I, just so I can see the console here. And I'm gonna give it a prompt. So I'm gonna do three chocolate Labrador retrievers. Now, okay, unexpected doc type is not valid JSON. Okay, I got a typo somewhere. Okay, so I was missing a close parentheses or a close bracket. Let me refresh this again. Okay, I still have an error. API generate index line 17. I actually did not include all of this in that function, which I needed to. So where I messed up is, oh no, I did. Okay, this is why it helps to save your work in incremental steps because this is mad that I definitely have some, a, a, a typo somewhere. So, or just in this throwing it off as a syntax error. So let me, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna just walk through the code and see, I'll probably just comment some stuff out on submit 404 not found API. Okay. Okay. is definitely failing on this step. So if I were to bet, so it's failing to do this. API generate. So I could comment the rest of this out and this would still fail, sure. 
So now you're getting to see me do a little debugging. I didn't expect to have to do that. Okay, so it's saying API slash generate is not found. Did I spell something incorrectly? Oh, ooh, okay. So I see what my problem is actually. Uh, I created the API folder alongside pages, but the API folder should actually be inside of the folder pages. So what you can do is you can drag the API folder to pages and do move. Yes. Uh, I'm going to uncomment this stuff that I commented and I'm going to click save. So the error was valid that it couldn't find API generate because it wasn't there. So I'm going to refresh this page again and then I'll do three chocolate labs. Let's see what we get. And I also need to show something. Okay. So we're not going to see it on, on, in the browser just yet, but we did get an image. So this is, this is why we're logging it using the console log. So if I were to copy this and paste that into my browser, this should in theory show me three chocolate labs. No, it doesn't. But I wonder why, can you understand why this is not showing a chocolate lab and why it's showing a white Siamese cat? So just take a moment and think about it, right? The reason that this is happening is because if we go back to the generate function, where we're calling the API, the prompt that we're using is just a white Siamese cat. So in order to use the actual image prompt that we created, let's erase that. And let's do these back ticks, dollar sign, open and close bracket, and then, or uh, curly brace, and then let's do image prompt. And notice this image prompt is gonna be this one here. This is where we are getting the value of the image prompt. Okay, so now instead of using a white Siamese cat every time, we're gonna be generating the image prompt that comes from the URL. So let's just go ahead and save that. And I'll go back into my project and I don't think I need to refresh, but I'll refresh. And let's try three chocolate Labrador retrievers again. I don't know if I press generate, press create image, but let me press it and we'll wait. Okay, we just got an image. So let's copy this and let's see what it gave us. Oh, I think I just copied the same thing over. Hang on. So we'll copy that. And paste. All right, three chocolate labs. So we could try um night skyline and let's go back to the browser or go back to the console the command line and let's get this you new url let's copy it and let's paste all right we've got a, a night skyline i mean it's night nice sky, but okay. So now we have the image being generated and we have it being generated dynamically. We've, we've modified this so that now we're using our prompt and we send the image back, but how do we actually get the image to display on this screen? So there, that is something else that we'll need to do. So in order to display, so now that's the next step, update the view to show an image. So when we think about the view, uh, an image, what is, which is what we want to show, is going to have a URL. So I'm thinking in terms of how can this be displayed from an HTML point of view. So below here, 
I'm actually going to uh, create. So back in back in the HTML part, I have to think about where I want this image to to show. And down here, when we did this, uh, let's see high resolution night skyline. Let's try this again. So this displayed under the button and notice that it popped up below it. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's create something that's going to go below it. So in this case, I believe that this should be a, an image. Like I, I want to display an image on the screen. So in order to display an image, I'll create an image here and the source should be equal to the source for the image, which is going to be the URL for the image. I want that to be equal to image result. Now you may ask, where am I getting that from? The reason that I'm getting and using image result is because I'm going to actually set that to this value. I'm setting image result value whenever actually I think I hold on yeah it should be right so so whenever I get this back I'm actually setting the image result value already so now I want the value to be displayed in an image. Now I'm going to, there, there is something else that I need to do. But when I save this, as you can see, it pops up, right? So let me refresh this page and let me do it, do this again. So I'll create an image. Okay, so I have another image that is being displayed, which is good. So we're making progress. The image is now being displayed on the screen. That's good. Now we haven't made any adjustments to the visual aspects of it yet. We're going to get there, but let's just focus on the functionality for now. So I noticed that, uh, Let's see. Let's see if I wanted to download. Let's what would I need to do? Um Yeah, let's let's do that. So if I wanted to download this image, what would be the next thing that you could think would be needed to download? So I'm actually going to create another API. File. Well, before I do that, uh update the view to show an image this is actually already done so this happens up here so once it gets the information this is what happens it updates the view all right now we need to download the image so what needs to happen in order to download the image well we're going to do something very similar to what we did in the previous one um, where we were getting the prompt, getting the image from open API. So in our case, let's look at our other example here. So how do we download the image? We actually have an, an image button or download image button that's displaying below this image. So whenever we have an image, we want to be able to download it. So let's go ahead and create another button that's going to allow us to download. So let's do that first. And this is relatively simple. So this is going to be button. And I want to do on click. So when this button is clicked, I want it to do something. And I'm going to call this something that I want it to do download image and let's just call this download image this is the text that's going to show inside the button 
just like in on submit we had to create that function let's do the same thing here where we're going to create a function that's going to actually uh, download so this is going to be an async function and let's uh, call this Okay, so we're gonna do, like I said, we're gonna do something really similar. We're gonna do another try, we're gonna do a catch and catch the error. Um, I'm going to copy and paste the solution for this. So we're downloading the image. Let me move that here. So we wanna download the image and we're going to create, as you, if you can tell, we're gonna create another file. But before I do that, I want to finish off this catch. So try to download or try to download the image. If it doesn't work, then tell me why. Okay. So if you would notice, we have to create another file and this file is going to be download image because we're going to be downloading. We're going to put the bulk of the work in that file. So let's just save this as it is. And this should not have an error okay okay so now we we'll go back into our api and go to new file and we want to call this download image.js now for download image js there are a lot of different ways that you can download a file but i'm just going to go through uh, one of the ways that i used and then i know that again there's no right or wrong way there are just many ways to do the same thing so what we're going to use is a module called Axios, which allows you to make calls. This is you know, make API calls to do a thing. So someone has already created a lot of the hard work to download files. And instead of me trying to reinvent the wheel to make my own project to download files, I'll just use something that someone else has created. And so that's essentially what this is. Now I'm going to I'm going to actually copy, I'm not going to copy it all just yet, but I want to go step by step. So similar to the other file. So we're going to start with an async function and what we want to do is we want to get the information from the image. So we want to get the image URL. So the download function is going to only care about what the image of the, uh, the image is that it's trying to download. So we're going to do a parse to get from that information. We're going to get that information from our, uh, from our front end. So that's, that's what we're doing here. And then we're going to make sure that the value that the image URL is an actual value, okay? Then I want to copy some more work. And I'll tell you what this is doing in a moment. So you copy this line and this is this is going to be unique to you in your file system. So right now it says output directory, but this is going to be unique to yours. So you will need to find whatever your downloads folder is, and you'll need to replace that here with your information. Uh, so it's going to do a couple of things. Uh, and this, it hasn't even started downloading the file yet, but uh, let me actually copy the code to download the file. Okay, so this is the main part of it, download image. I'm creating this function called download image that's going to take a URL and it's going to take an output directory. So I want it to tell me where the file is. This is going to be the source. And then I'm going to, I want something to tell me where to put the file whenever I'm finished. So that's what this is. Uh, I'm getting, I created a function to generate a random 
uh, name so that anytime I'm downloading the file, it will give me a different name every time. So the file name, I'm saving it as download and then this random value that comes here. Uh, so uh, again, I hope this makes sense to you, but essentially this is how we're gonna be downloading the file. Uh, so you can just copy and paste this code. If you need some extra assistance with understanding how this is working, then let me know. Um, but as I mentioned, I created a function to get the random string. And so that's what this is. Um, I'm, every time I run this, it's going to give me a new name. So it will save that file as a new name. So this is the download image function. So the download image function is complete. So if I go back to index.js, I'm essentially saying download the image on this download image function. So when the button is clicked to download image, it's going to send a call to download image. And if there are no errors, so it's going to do all of this work. If there are errors, it's going to give me an error. But if not, everything worked fine. So now let me save that. And let me come back in here. I don't know if this will work right now or if I need to refresh, but let me just try to download and see what happens. Oh, it did download. Okay, so it downloaded this image, right? Now, if I were to, so now I want it, so now it's downloading, but what about whenever, well, first of all, I need I need this to look a little better. So we're downloading the image, which is, you know, project successful, but it doesn't look like this. And what about, so let me refresh this. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't look right. So what I wanna do now is I wanna start to add a little bit of styling to it. So now that I know the functionality works, it, I can add styling. And then another thing is actually, before I do that, notice that this download image button is showing, well, there's no image. I don't wanna show this image. I don't wanna show download image if it doesn't actually exist. So um, I wanna do two things now. I wanna fix that. And I wanna add a little bit of styling so that it looks a little more like the other one. Now, for styling, uh, that can be a whole nother uh, thing all by itself. I'm not gonna go into styling, but I know a lot of people would, a lot of people try to avoid that, um, myself included, but uh, <laughs> it works. So. I have a um, a CSS file that I'm going to drag and drop over here. So I'm going to drag and drop it into this pages directory and it should go alongside this index.js file. Uh, and so I'm copying that CSS over there and then um, and really what CSS is for those who don't know just really quickly, CSS allows you to style your HTML pages. So it gives you flexibility into making the HTML page look a certain way. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the uh, where I'm creating the HTML. And the way that you connect your CSS file, you can do this a couple ways, but the way that you connect it to your individual components is usually through classes on the CSS file or even using the ID or classes within the HTML or using like an ID. Um, in my case, I'm using classes. So uh, let's, so you'll see as I'm saving it, you'll see how these things are changing. So in main, for instance, there's a class name or before I do this, this won't work. I need to import one more thing in order to use that file. I need to actually import the file. So I need to import styles from 
that file. Okay, now that I've imported that, I should be able to use it. So now I want I want class name equals, and then open close curly braces. I'm gonna say style dot main. Now let me save that real quick. Okay, now you can see it's already started to make a major difference. It's used this. It's used the class name main in this file, and it's applying all of the CSS to that. Okay, so we can move on to the next one. Uh, let's see. I've got another one, and for. H3 actually. Okay. So now notice that changed this text. I made it a little bit different. All right. Now I have more. So I also have a button that I would like to use. So, um, or that I would have that I would want to style. So if I go down to this button and I'll go to class name, I can do styles.download button. Okay, so I still got something else in here. Now, I know I'm working on the functionality of this right now, but, or I'm working on the visual aspects of it. But remember, there's something else we want to change. So right now I see this blank image. Uh, this, that's what this is. If I were to go back into my browser and kind of, and remember I can do this with command option I, um, but if I click this button, this allows me to see the contents on the page, like kind of the break, the breakdown of it. So if I hover over this, I can see that's a blank image. Now, I don't want this to show unless there's an actual image on the page. And so this is why it's important to be able to use state in your application because you can control when objects are displaying on the screen. Now, or you can always determine what the current state is and display information based on that state. So in order to do this, I'm actually going to, uh, I want us to do this. So I want you to copy this line or these last two lines and I actually want you to cut them so you can uh, do command K or I'm sorry, command X or just do cut. Okay. Now write this syntax. So I want to say if the image result well, I'll, I'll explain it once I'm finished writing Just one second. Okay. All right. What this is saying is if image result, so, uh, so we want to create a div. And then within the div, we want to paste the values that we just cut. So the image and the button. But what this is saying is if image result exists. So if I have a value for image result, then display this. If there is no value for image result, none of this is shown 
So I don't see a button and I don't see an image. And that's the way it should work. So, and then the other thing is I created this div that encapsulates the image and the button. And I have a style that's connected to that. And it's, the style is really for um, aesthetics to display these like in a single line. So if I'll save that, now you notice that this image is gone or the image is gone, the image tag is gone. You can see it's, it's not showing here anymore. So that's what I want. If I were to generate a prompt, just generate dogs uh, and click create image. I'll wait for it. And I see I have an image created. Now there's something else I want to do here. I want to create some, uh, this should be on the new line. Um, I'll do that with just a BR tag. Oh. I don't need both of these. Oh, I think that's the syntax. No, there it goes. Okay. So now you see I have an image showing on a separate line from the button. So this would work as well. Now I could, there's something else that we're missing here. So this project is almost done. There's only one thing that we need to add and that's the logo here. So notice that there's even this icon up here where we're displaying this logo. And then we also have the logo here. So those are the next things that we want to add. And in order to add that, I need to have, I mean, honestly, you could stop here, but I just want to finish this part off. So uh, we want to have a, another folder. Let's call this folder public. And this folder goes in the main root directory. So we'll create a, a folder called public. And then if you have a logo design or, or an image that you want to use, this is where you would put the image. So I'm just going to drag and drop the image into this folder. And from here, I'm going to go back to my uh, index.js file. And there are two lines that I want to add. The first line for my head now this is this head here is basically the value that's showing in the top left under in the tab and this also gives me the option to insert an image so i'm going to reference that image here so i reference the image using a relative link it's showing that this is an icon and this is the file so anything that you put inside of this public folder you can just reference it using the slash and then the file name so when i save that now you can see this has changed this image right here or has added that image and then there's one more thing that i want to do and i want to add an image let's see over here we have the image right above this h1 tag so let's do that or h3 tag rather so i will put that image there and the image i i'm using the one that's in public so i'll just use that url or that path save and there is the project okay so now i want to let's say generate a kid learning in the future and I'm gonna close this by the way while I wait okay so as we can see we have the project we have a kid learning in the future so if we want to we can click download to download this image and I think I click download. Let me click download again. Okay, I see it. Okay, and I see the file has downloaded. And notice that there is this 
random number or random name, random letters that are here. I want if I press download again, maybe it downloads another file and it does, as you can see, it does that. So here we have it. Same file, downloaded, different name. All right. So this is this project. Now, hopefully you've been able to see how we were able to connect with an API that's already existing. We've connected to the OpenAI API. We've actually even connected to an Axios uh, API where we were able to figure out how to download images or how to, yeah, how to download images. So I want for you to start to think of ways that you can use this or how you can leverage this in your creative projects or maybe even in your business. We've seen that in that in society right now, there are a number of jobs that are being replaced. We are seeing that there are a lot of AI tools that are being created that are replacing a lot of these jobs. Now, most of what we've seen in society has been from a, consu from a consumer standpoint, but hopefully you will be empowered by this and even future courses where we'll go over other ways that you can tap into APIs. The APIs are there for you to use. They're there as uh, as they're publicly available for you for you to use. So go ahead and tap into them. If you ever run into any stumbling blocks along the way, maybe getting your development project or development environment set up, or maybe you don't know what language to use, then always feel free to reach out. Uh, we're in the process of getting ready to launch some courses, some free and uh, paid content where we'll be discussing how to get applications started, how to get your application built. So I've shown you just a simple example of creating a image generator, but there's so many other things that we can do. There's so many things that even I haven't even conceptualized of yet. And it's not because they're impossible. That's just because we need your unique minds thinking of other projects to build. So the next time that you're about to use a new AI product, ask yourself, is this something that I can do on my own? Is this something that I can create from on my own? Is this something that I can use to give someone else, maybe so that they can create something on their own? Is there some type of way that I can connect into the API to build another project on top of what someone else has already built? Remember, when it comes to AI, the tools, or when it comes to technology, the tools are at our fingertips. AI is just one of the many tools that is available to us right now. So there are so many different ways to tap in. Now, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna create? The choice is yours. You have everything within you right now to build whatever it is that you wanna create. Most of us never even really believe that. Most of us don't really realize how many opportunities we pass by every day or how many opportunities are really and literally at our fingertips. So maybe you haven't created ChatGPT first, or maybe you haven't created the Remini app first, or maybe you haven't created insert this name of an API or AI tool just yet. But that doesn't mean that you are too late to the punch. That doesn't mean that you can't use the AI that is already there. That doesn't mean that you can't tap into these tools that other developers have created by using the APIs that they've made available. So again, I ask you, what is it that you want to create? What is it that you will create next? Think about that just for one second. And just imagine, even if it seems impossible, the technology may or may not be there right now, but that doesn't mean that it won't be. AI is allowing us to move at an exponential rate. So in the future, while we're talking about building AI tools, there are going to be AI tools building other AI tools. So you're going to have to start to think about the future from a standpoint of how can you sustain? How can you sustain financially? How can you sustain in, in the security stand from a security standpoint? How can you protect yourself, your family, your assets? How can you protect all of the things that you hold near and dear to your heart using the power of technology? It starts with just learning a little bit at a time. So again, my name is Martin G. I hope this has been very, very helpful for you. And 
I, this is my first time actually recording and releasing because you're going to see this. And so if you have any questions, if you have some feedback, please let me know. Uh, I recorded this, uh, I recorded hours and hours worth before, and then I just kind of scrapped all of that and decided to do it over. But I really hope this has been helpful. The goal is to make this as uniquely helpful for you as possible. I want you to see that it's possible to create apps. It's possible to create web apps. It's possible to tap into AI. And yes, we've, we've done this one example, but we have so many other examples in the future to do. And again, this has been Tech Talk Tuesday. Next time we talk, hopefully you will have created this project. But if you haven't, again, reach out, corridoroffameacademy.com. I can be reached there. You can feel free to leave a comment, like, share, and subscribe wherever you may be. Talk to you later and good luck.